Okay, shalom to everyone. Uh, today, of course, is Yom Sheni. Is the <coughs> we have reached already uh, uh, Dalid of the other Sheni, which puts us uh, roughly ten days before the actual Purim, ten days till Purim. The countdown is here, and <clears throat> this will be the the final shear that I will give before Purim. Uh, um, because I will be leaving next Thursday, uh, this week, later this week, uh, to New York for two weeks for, for my uh, annual Matanas Lev Yonim campaign. I will send information to um, Mrs. Leshin about how to participate. And of course, I'll be taking names for Tfilos and Makomos Kadoshim in the New York area, particularly by the Lubavitch Rebbe and hopefully by the Ribnitzer Rebbe in Muncie uh, when I arrive there. So uh, it's, it's um, I, my apologies that I will not be here till then. I, and uh, we can then resume the Shurim till we get closer to Pesach. Okay. All right, so um, I wanted to share with you just some thoughts about Megillus Esther since this is our last year before Esther. Now, there, there's an interesting uh, halacha regarding uh, Purim, regarding our diet on Purim day. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna share that with you. Let me just quote it from you inside. Excuse me a moment. Um, so, in addition to the uh, the seuda, there are certain things that are customary to be eaten on on uh, Purim itself. Okay, and the halacha records as follows. Okay, mitzvah laharbos besudas Purim. It's a mitzvah to have a joyous seuda, to have an elaborate seuda. This is in Simon Tafresh Tzadik Hay, the laws of the Suda of Purim from Shulchan Aruch. Uh, however, the night is not the time to make the Suda, only during the day. So the question is why? What's the difference? We have, if Purim is Purim and we read the Megillah, why is the nighttime not appropriate for the Suda? And the Ramah adds here, Mikomakom Gambalayla Yismach B'yirbak Tzas Suda. You should have a little bit of a suda at night, a little bit. Question is, well, if, if we're going to make the suda, make a proper suda. You know, it's why, why are we doing it both ways? In other words, yeah, so what does this mean? A little bit of happiness? Why only a little bit of happiness? I thought, uh, Perm, we can be happy uh, and joyous the whole time. And then it goes into the uh, mitzvah that we, we talked about last week, correct? Chayav inish libsumi bi paraya. Correct? We explained that. You remember what we spoke about last week? And that is a bare repeating? Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So the second mitzvah is a very strange one. It says a person, it says inish. It doesn't say man or woman, but it says inish, which usually means men, but it's a, it's a, Aramaic word, and it's live sume bipuraya. You should have fragrant wine. Now, besamim is what they used to put in the wine, but that's not the word for wine. So it should say, chayav adam lishtos bipuraya, lishtos yayin, which we, we should be obligated to drink wine. Why does it say live sume bipuraya, to drink fragrantly spiced wine? What's, what's that about? And um, obviously, this is a, a, a difficult concept because how are we supposed to drink to such an extent that we can't even identify that Haman is the Russia? That is really uh, a, a vast amount of wine, and it does not seem to be consistent with the general idea of doing mitzvot. A person has to be... Um, not inebriated, you can't. Davin, you can't even, if you can't hold your words as you would in front of a king, you cannot Davin. That, that's a couple of drinks. And a Kohen cannot Duchen if he even takes one drink, because even one drink will put you 
a little bit out of your normal. So why would the rabbis um, require us to drink in, and put us in at risk of not being able to daven, or certainly not being able to learn properly, or to focus on the Megillah, perhaps? Um, depending. So, so the Ramos says, you don't have to get that drunk. You should drink more than you're accustomed to drinking. And then there, there's the eight sub. You can go to sleep and then you knock out your seichel by going into the sleep mode. And that would be you would fulfill your, your uh, requirements. Um, you know, one safety net, though, is if you do your Sudas Purim after Mincha, uh, then at least you you will uh, you could still have a, a, a relative amount of drinking, and just our concern would just be that um, would be the Mar of Tefillah. Okay, so so this this question number two. Why is question number one? Why does it say that we should only have a little bit of Simcha at night? Question number two is. Um, why this notion of besumim, besumim, besume? It's a strange word for wine. Okay, so it's not the not the typical word for wine. And why this vast amount, and which is so problematic? Now the Ramah says, "Well, I don't know how we're going to achieve that. Maybe we'll have to go to sleep altogether." Uh, okay. Now there is a minhug, and this is what I want to add. Very important question. Norma brings Yesh Omim Shiyesh Lechol Maachal Zironim Bipurim. You know that there's a certain type of Hamantash that has seeds. What's it called? Kimmel, right? Is it Kimmel? Pereg. Pereg, right? In Hebrew, it's Pereg. What is it called in there? Mun. Mun. Mun, right. Mun. Poppy seeds. This is a fulfillment, actually, of a, of a halacha in Shulchan Aruch that says that we're supposed to eat zaronim. We lost you, Rabbi. On Purim, something with seeds, zera, and zecher uh, to whom? Why were they That they only vegan. Who was a vegan in the in the in the story of Purim? Esther. Who would you, you would think you would think Esther, right? Uh, that's not it. The person we're supposed to eat zeronim in in honor of is zecher lezaronim sheachal Daniel bechaverav bebavel. One second. What does Daniel have to do with the story of Purim? In other words, Daniel, Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah, they ate, obviously, when they were with Nebuchadnezzar, not Achashverosh, they ate vegetables. That's what they demanded vegetables. They wanted to feed them, uh, you know, rack, what do they call them? Uh, Rack of ribs, the uh, you know pork ribs, pork uh, whatever they call it, and that's what they wanted to feed Esther as well. So it comes out that, that there is some sort of important connection between the festivities of Purim and Daniel's eating vegetables. Why? What in the world could possibly be a connection? Now, if you want to say Esther also was vegetarian. Fine, but then say that we're eating it in in honor of Esther, not in honor of Daniel and his friends, Hananya, Mishael, and Azaria. Okay, so uh, so Mishnah Bur says here, Daniel uh, v'chaveiro v'gam Esther achla zeronim kedarmina perakamad megila v'yeshna and things went well because she ate zeronim. Now, it says there that Esther is a debate about Esther's beauty. Some say that Esther was among the most beautiful women of all time. 
But the Gemara in Megillah has a differing view that Esther, it says, Yerak Rokis Haisa. She had a green complexion. Now, green is not considered a beautiful complexion, right? So where did she get that green complexion from? From the fact that all she ate was greens. Greensin, like they say. And yet, okay, we attribute this. See, the Mishnah Bura is challenged by the question we ask. He says, okay, that's very nice. Daniel, is it the Neil A. That's not a holiday. That's a that's a tragedy. They were they were in the court of uh, they were in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, and they had to do that, and they were they were actually uh, almost killed there, in many different ways. Chananya, Mishra, and Lazaria were thrown into a fiery furnace, right, and they were miraculously miraculously escaped, and Daniel was thrown into what? A guv arayos into a lion's den. And they were very hungry lions, by the way. They wanted to make sure that the lions were not fed for a long time because a, a, a satiated lion is not necessarily interested in attacking. Lions are notoriously lazy and they, are, they tend to sleep most of the day. You ever go to the zoo? They're not like walking around all the time, they just kind of lay there until it's time to eat something. And then they send out the ladies to hunt. I don't know if you know that. The men is still, still just lay there. Because the reality is that lions, male lions, are not good hunters because they are not fast. There's only one way a lion can get its prey is uh, if it sneaks up on them and pounces on them. It, you know, but if it's going to chase, it cannot win a chase. Animals will outrun a lion, but they're not going, you know, if it, so that the, the lion kind of hides and pounces. Well, these were very, very hungry lions, and they should have consumed Daniel in an instant. And of course, they laid down to him, and they act, they act like behemos. Wait a second. What do behemos eat? Do they eat meat? A behemoth is like a cow, uh, a chamor, these are not meat-eating animals. They're domesticated farm animals. What do they eat? Vegetation. So one second. There's another connection to Daniel about vegetables. <laughs> and that is that the lions who are meat eaters and destroyers were transformed into innocuous behemoths that eat nothing but straw. And if they see a pile of straw, yummy. And if they see a human being, they go, where's my straw? Okay, that's what happened. And so it's almost a second, and I would suggest another hidden reference, not just to Daniel eating vegetation to escape, you know, uh, from violating Torah. But the point is, is that they, those three, Kanani Rishal Zaya plus Daniel, were in a larger sense about to be, were, were entrapped in the house of Ahashvera, of, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar, which was mortal danger all the time. And they, served, they, they were able to tame the beast. You understand? They were able to take destructive fire and it turned into innocuous, nothing. Daniel was able to stand up to a lion hungry lions and turn them into gentle, gentle souls. Now, that is a unique experience for Daniel. And it seems to me that this is what we're eating about. We're eating about the fact that these individuals, particularly Daniel, were able to withstand the, you know, the, the, uh, the mortal threats that he had and his friends had in the house of Nebuchadnezzar and stand before him? For what reason? Okay, so that's my question. Is it a good question? What, it's very interesting, but what does it have to do with Megillus Esther? Wrong holiday. Okay, we could talk about it, I don't know when, but it's not for now. Okay, so let's just uh, understand some. Uh, we, we've asked <clears throat> on this halacha why it's here. Why eating vegetables is important on Purim? Mon, mon hamantashins, anything with seeds. Seeds, zera is the key. 
Next question was, why live sume? What is this thing about the fragrant wine? You know what besamim usually mean? Besamim means spices, spices. What do spices have to do with the Purim? What do spices have to do with Purim? There's nothing to do. Okay, so two oddities. The third question that we asked was, why are we only celebrating during the day and at night a little bit? What kind of little bit celebration? Whoever heard of a little party? I come to the party, oh, uh, uh, but you can't get too happy. Uh, not too happy. Stop. Make one drink, not two drinks, not three drinks. What's, what's, what's this all about? So I want to suggest that there's an important undercurrent in this story. Like there are so many hidden variables in, in the Megillah Sester, including Hashem's name. And the most important one is the fact that the Megillah has two names, has no name of Hashem, correct? But it does have a hidden reference to Hashem, which is what? There's actually, there's actually a general hidden reference, and then there's two specific hidden hidden references. Okay, if you take the pasuk, Yavo Hamelech. Hold on, Hamelech Haman. Hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that in a second. Hold on, I'll give you that in a second. The letters spell out Hashem's name, Yud Kei Vav Kei, on the Pasuk of the Mishteh. Okay, the Mishteh that she made. Hold on, okay, the Mishteh. It says, Batomer Esther. This is Perak Hey, Pasuk Dalid. Batomer Esther, Im Alamelech Tob, Yavo Hamelech Vehaman Hayom. Okay, Haman should come, the king should come, Yavo HaMelech VeHaman Hayom, El HaMishta Asher Asisi Lo. Spell out, take the first letters of Yavo, Yud, HaMelech, Hey, VeHaman. We keep losing you, Rabbi. Don't hear. No audio. Be patient, he'll be back. But does he know it? Because I'd like to hear what he's saying. I'm with you. <laughs> oh, we gotta be able to tell him. He, he lost his, I'm going to, I'm going to pause the record. Okay. Okay, good. How could, how, how could it be that Esther with her Ruach HaKodesh wrote this hidden reference to Hashem in her words? She said it by Ruach HaKodesh, which means it was divinely inspired. Yavo HaMelech V'Haman Hayom. In, uh, in, every, in all ways. Now, the other hidden reference, of course, is the word Hamelech itself. Any time in the Megillah that it says the word Hamelech, who is it a reference to? Melech Malchai Hamlachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Any time it says in the Megillah Melech Achashverosh, it means the historical figure of Achashverosh. Okay? So here, in the hidden reference of Hashem's name, it doesn't say Hamelech Achashverosh, it says Ayavo. Yavo HaMelech Haman. Hashem is coming together with Haman. You think he likes hanging out with Haman? The Kosh Baruch Hu wants to hang out with Haman. With Amishta, what's going on? Good. Any thoughts? I want to hear from the I want to hear from the class. Any thoughts on these ideas? What is why would Hashem's name be hidden like that? Yavo HaMelech Haman Hayom. And why is it hidden in general? in the Gilas Esther, as opposed to Beferish. And why the seeds for Daniel, of all people? And then, of course, why a half simcha at night? Who can say? Who wants to suggest any sort of approach here? Anyone have any ideas? No, I want to hear something. 
Well, the, well, idea, the idea of Daniel to me reminds me of the lion will lie down with the lamb. Oh, okay. The taming of the lion, right? Yeah, Ultimately, yes. the lion is tamed. Exactly, exactly. And th that's very nice. So the concept being, according to you, I'm sorry, who's speaking? I didn't, didn't see. Who was that? That just shared. I don't want to identify. Okay. Chaya. It's Chaya. Oh, Chaya. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So according to this, there's some sort of reference to the day when Zaronim will be what lions eat, period. As opposed to eating Daniel. <laughs> Daniel ate Zaronim. He's identified as a Zara, as a Zaron. He's a he's a shtick vegetable, right? But, and so was Esther, Yerak Rokas Haisa. She was green, not in the ecological sense, of course, but in, a, in, a, uh, in her appearance. Okay, so that's a clue, definitely a clue. All right, let's, let's see if we can dig a bit deeper. Okay. Where is Daniel hidden in the Megillah himself? that might give justification to his reference with this minhag of eating mon hamantashen. Does anybody know? He appears under a different name. It's, a, it's based on the Gemara Megillah Daf Tesvav. Who remembers the name of the messenger that ran messages between Haman, between? Memuchan. You happen to be correct. There is a, there is a statement in the Gemara that Memuchan, it was Daniel actually, which is quite, quite surprising because normally we, we associate it with uh, Haman himself. But put that aside for a second. There's another, you happen to be correct, I'm saying that is a hidden reference to uh, Daniel according to Midrash, some Midrashim. Uh, but there is a one that's more, more explicit that's mentioned in the Gemara Megillah Dav Tesvav, and that is the person who ran messages between Esther and Mordechai, what was that fellow's name? Who remembers? Starts with a hey, and it's only three letters, and it wasn't Haman. Hasach, Hasach. Let's go to the. Let's go to the. Um, let's go to the text. Okay, Mordechai shows up with Sakva Efar. Esther is so distressed that some say she lost a child. She miscarried. Whose child? Mordechai's child. Because she was at that point permitted to be with Mordechai. All of a sudden, the zera, the seed of Esther and Mordechai are, is destroyed by the agitation of Haman. And then, uh, so it says like this, Vatavona, Naros, Esther, Vesariseha, Vayagidula. They say to her, um, that there's terrible news. Terrible news about Haman's plans. And Vatishlach, Begodim, Lahalbish, is Mordechai, Lazir, Sakam, Elav, Lokibel. Mordechai was sent clothing by Esther and a message. Vatikra Esther lehasach misarisei hamelech from the ones who served the king. Asher hemid lefaneha v'titzavehu al Mordechai ladas maze ve'al maze. Hasach is identified as Daniel. The gematria of Daniel, the Medrash tells us, is 95. Identically, identical to Haman. Haman and Daniel have the same gematria. So Daniel changed his name. That's one shot. Others said, Chathuhu migdulato, Hasach. Hasach is, is, um, <clears throat> Is means that he was demoted in his authority because he was the authority figure in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. But now that Haman was in charge, he was demoted because he was the most famous Jew of all. 
before Hump Mordechai rose to prominence, Daniel. Daniel is the Rebbe. In fact, the Gemara in Megillah tells us that Daniel was a Navi, that there were seven people who had Navua on that very day. Um, this was, goes back to the Navua about Balshatzar, the king who succeeded uh, Nebuchadnezzar, that he would be terminated. And uh, he's counted among the Nevi'im. So, and Esther only had Ruach HaKodesh originally, but her mentor and Mordechai's mentor, their teacher was Daniel. Daniel was the teacher. And somehow he's kind of like an anti Haman, so much so that Esther sends Mordechai a message with Hasach, the anti Haman, and says, Wait, put on clothes. We'll figure out a way to do this. I'll figure out a way how to approach the king. And Mordechai will have none of it. He says, I'm sorry, but I reject that approach. We are not going to work direct, we're not going to work together with a political persuasion. What we are going to do is that we're going to do open confrontation, open confrontation. Well, if that's the case, guess what happens? In the shuttling back and forth between Esther and Mordechai, Hasach, aka Daniel, was detected as somehow passing messages between Mordechai and Esther talking about how to undo Haman's wicked plot. Haman gets wind of this, and he murders Daniel. What Nebuchadnezzar couldn't do, Haman was able to do. It was a tragic, tragic moment in the history of the Jewish people, although we say it had a positive side, because misas tzadikim mechaprim, it was the death of Daniel that opened up the possibility to destroy Haman. In other words, Haman played directly into Hamelech Hashem's Hashkocha Protis. By murdering Daniel, he actually gave the Jewish people the gift of being able to overcome him and destroy him. So Daniel comes out to be a central figure in the story of Megillah's Esther. Number one, he was the Rebbe of Esther and Mordechai. Number two, he was the one that was guiding them in how to overturn and the plot to overturn um, uh, uh, Haman's decrees. And I would suspect that he had some influence on, on the, di dif the difficult decision that Esther and Mordechai made, which was to start a three-day fast. Now, what's the point of this three-day fast? Chazal tell us that it coincided with which holiday, with which yontif? Pesach, which means that there was no Seder that year. It was the only year in Jewish history, at least for sure in Shushan Habira, where the Jews were not allowed to observe Per, uh, Seder, even if they had the ability to do so. So what was, that requires a big, big heter. So it says, Vayavor Mordechai. Mordechai went and implemented the decrees of, of Mordechai. Esther said to Mordechai, uh, Mordechai said, okay, Esther, what do you want? He says, I want a three-day fast. Well, well, what do you mean? That includes the Seder. We're going to skip the Seder? Yeah, we're going to skip the Seder. The four cups that you're going to drink on the Seder night are actually going to be turned into another type of mishteh. It's going to be the wine that will destroy Haman HaRasha. So it's not the wine of You'd see us Mitzrayim. It's going to be the wine of what? Mechias Amalek. It's a different cup of wine that we're going to have this year. And the only way we can do it is by fasting. And, and uh, those three days. So I would like to suggest that Daniel is a key fact factor in this story. And he's memorialized 
not by his death, but by his life. He managed to withstand a life and death. And I'll tell you one more thing. By giving up his life, Daniel gave his life for Messiris Nefesh to inspire Mordechai and Esther to go ahead with their plan. He, he somehow communicated or, um, or Esther understood. And here's where I'm going to get to my own added insight here. I believe the following, which is really, really a big chiddush, but I think it's, it's very well grounded. It says, Vatilbash Esther Malchus. Esther puts on Malchus, which means Ruach HaKodesh. Okay. Daniel was a member of the Davidic household. He was an, a, a, a descendant of David HaMelech. And what he does is he transfers his Malchus, which he really was Yoresh, from David HaMelech back to Esther. In other words, it's like David, David actually, David's descendant, did the ultimate sacrifice. Because who is he transferring the power to? To the descendants of Binyamin, who are not from the house of David. They're, they're the opposite. They're the, the children of Rachel. In recognition of the fact that when we deal with Amalek, the key figure is not Yehuda and David. David finishes the job, but the person who must start the job is Shaul HaMelech. Shaul HaMelech from Shevet Binyamin. As it says in Yaakov's Brachos to the sons, Binyamin is like Zev Toref. And if you look at the Meforshim Rashi brings there, it says he was like a wolf compared to the lion of David HaMelech, of Yehuda. Yehuda was considered like, it was a compared to a lion. Why? It says a wolf is a dangerous beast. But one wolf in the Mishnah is not considered enough for a shepherd to say, well, I couldn't save my flock because this wolf came. Yeah, you take a stick and you beat him off. It's a danger. If it's more than one wolf, or if it's a wolf that's coming at a time when they're ravenous, then the Mishnah and Bamakama says, then you can, you can make an excuse that I wasn't, uh, I couldn't, I couldn't stop him. But a lion is always unstoppable. The lion is coming to attack the flock. The shepherd is always a, always exempted. He's not negligent. So the Malchus of Klal Yisrael which represents the power to destroy the enemies of Klal Yisrael, and specifically Amalek, starts off like a wolf and ends like a lion. It grows. Stage one, wolf stage. Stage two, lion stage. Daniel throws the Malchus backwards to Mordechai and Esther. He says, okay, I'm from Melech David. I'm giving my life now so that you can restart the process of a Mechias Amalek. Remember, there is no Melech without Mechias Amalek. So how could Esther be a Malka when Haman's still floating around? And the answer is, Daniel gave his life so that it was a done deal that Haman was going to be eradicated. It was only a matter of days. And it was only a matter of a formality at that point. It was in truth Daniel who secured the victory over Haman. Remarkable. And that's why we eat Zeronim seeds on that day. Why? What do we say? Im mi zera ha Yehudim. If he's from the seed of the Jews, the advisors of Haman say to him, you're for sure to fall. That conversation took place right after the murder of Daniel. Do you understand? He says, He says, uh -huh. if they have been invested with the schus of the Messias Nefesh of the Tzaddik from the house of David, right? Who's Zerah HaYehudim, which by the way, answers another big mystery here. Mordechai is called Ha Yehudi. Is he a, is he a member of Shevet Yehuda? Now, so call him 
Ishimini. Just keep calling him Ishimini. Why is he called a Yehudi? Aha, now we know. Because the power of Yehuda was cast upon him by none other than his mentor, Daniel, who was from the tribe of Yehuda, except that he lent his power over to them so that they could have an, be empowered again. Remember, once Shaul was taken away from being Melech, so that's it. Yehud is the Melech. David and Melech can't take it away from David and Melech unless David and Melech and his family lets you borrow the Malchus for a little while. Just enough time to rebuild Yerushalayim, which is the capital of David and Melech's kingdom. So you understand it's a step backwards in order to take a step forwards. When we eat mun, hamantashin, or vegetables, or a salad, you have to eat something with seeds. What qualifies for that? Cucumbers, what qualifies for that? Tomatoes, you need a salad. What else has seeds in it? Ah, watermelon. But I don't think those are the seeds we're talking about. Edible seeds. Sprouts. What vegetables have ed edible seeds? Please help me out here. Sprouts. What's that? Sprouts, sun, sunflower sprouts. sprouts. Yeah. Ah, nivatim. I learned that word by going nivatim. to the salad store uh -huh. for my wife. Yeah, nivatim. Yeah. Okay. So sprouts. Yeah. But anyway, the idea being something remarkable happened here. The only way that Esther could be Zoha to wear the cloak of the Davidic Malchus was to fast three days do tshuva and daven like David and Melech davened. And then she would be given the royal, the royal garments, the shechina that would reside in the, in the base of Mikdash of David and Melech. Now that explains another mystery here in Megillah. There's a whole big deal made about the scepter of Achashverosh, right? Oh, if he gives you the, if he gives you his uh, uh, sharbit, if he extends it to you, then you live. And if he doesn't extend it to you and you approach him, you're going to be killed. And there's this moment, the Medrash describes it as a moment that was the most dramatic moment of all of the Megillah, it was when Esther appears with her, with her Malchut Begadim in front of Achashverosh without permission. And guess what happens? It says that Achashverosh was furious. He had had enough of Esther. His interests were waning in Esther. She wasn't called for 30 days. 30 days is a very long time not to speak to your wife, right? You're not supposed to go even three hours without speaking to your wife. Maybe not three minutes of silent treatment. But 30 days of silent treatment, what does that mean? He was already perhaps turning his attentions elsewhere. There was a, it was a maybe a frustration with her that she wasn't revealing who she was, whatever it might be. She maybe had fallen a little, about, uh, a little bit into disfavor. Not sure how. She did not know whether she would live or die. And in truth, what happened was, according to the Medrash, that Ahasuerus wanted to kill her, except what happened? Miraculously, Hashem made it that he, he, he had a moment of the rage transforming into chesed. Interesting. Like a lion turning into a behemoth like a ravenous, ravaging lion that wanted to eat and destroy, being tamed. Who tamed Ahasuerus' rage? Esther did. Where did she get the power to tame his rage? From her mentor, Daniel, who knew how to stand in front of the lion with his Tselem Elohim, and they just turned into simple straw-eating behemoths. That's what Esther was able to do to Ahasuerus's fury. And that was something that she has every, we have, we have, we're all indebted to Daniel and his Messias Nefesh for. So that explains why the rabbis were insistent on referencing Daniel 
and his mysterious nefesh of standing into the lion's den, because that mysterious nefesh, the ultimate one, which, where he, which he was killed for his mysterious nefesh to save Kal Yisrael, to mediate and to formulate the plan between Esther and Mordechai, he gave his life for that, and that's what saved us. That's really what saved us. Revach v'hatzala v'yehudim yamod m'akamacher but you and your family will be done. Meaning, guess what, Esther? If you don't take up the fight, right, then the Hatzalah will come from somebody else, maybe like Daniel. And you and your family, Binyamin, will never be redeemed from the partial job that they did. Now you understand why at night there is a partial Suda, because it represents part of the redemption, the part of the redemption of the defeat of, ha of Amalek by Shaul HaMelech, which was incomplete, which ultimately allowed Haman to escape because Agag lived and fathered descendants on that night, that the one night that ha Shaul gave him a, a stay of execution and a pardon until, of course, Shmuel and Avi comes and rips him to shreds the next day, which is also an interesting episode in itself. But Shaul's party is nighttime of Purim. It's a simcha. We did get away with a lot of Amalek, but we didn't get rid of all of Amalek. Therefore, it's a limited su'uda, I would like to suggest. But in the morning, when it's Esther's time, she was able to finish the job, of course, and, and completely eradicate the Amalek of that generation, including the Saras B'nai Hama. Okay, so that explains why it's a partial Suda. What other question did we ask? B'samim, right? So, Chayav Inish Libsume B'paraya. Okay, so we know that the Gemara in Megillah asks, Mordechai in a Torah Minayin. Where does, where's Mordechai referenced in the Torah? Where's Mordechai's name coded into the Torah? Does anybody know? Yeah, it says marjoror. What is marjoror? It is spices, right? That are taken for what purpose? To consecrate the kalim. It's called shemen ha mishcha, right? With which it was a miraculous jug of oil flavored with these spices. Dror, I, I think it's, is it myrrh? It's, is it myrrh? I don't know the English translation of it. But um it's a spiced fragrant oil that's used to make things separated for Kedusha and particularly the Kalim of the Mishkan were all consecrated with using this jug of oil uh, that was made with the marge roar. Now, what does that have to do with Mordechai? What in the world does that have to do with Mordechai? What are Chazal telling us here? Moshe made a jug of oil. It was miraculous because it lasted for many, many generations. And anytime you had a new keli for the base amig for the mishkan, you poured on it and it became holy. You also could use that oil to make who holy or chosen? Mashiach himself and a melech. You do a melech, okay? That, that melech is also uh, similar, similar to this. So it comes out that Mordechai has a connection to the consecration of the next iteration of the Mishkan, which would be the Beis HaMikdash. What does he have to do? What does Mordechai have to do with the Beis HaMikdash? Okay, so as we know, and I have mentioned this to you, I believe last week in passing, who remembers what I said about all the money from the house of Haman that was given to Mordechai? What did Mordechai do with it? He gave it to the Beis HaMikdash. Now, it's a fascinating little piece of history. Okay. That Koresh uh, decreed that the Jews have to go back. According to the Midrashim, the reason why he said go back and build the base of Migdash wasn't because he was such a big tzaddik. He was scared to death because Balshatzar got whacked and Daniel saw it coming and he didn't want to die the same fate as Balshatzar. And he said, I'm not using the king of Beis HaMikdash. He got killed over it. Daniel exposed him. I'm not losing my kingdom over it. I'm not losing my life over it. You take this stuff and get out of here. 
the faster the better. Take the Kalim of the base of Migdash and go. But what he didn't do was give him his own wealth. No wealth came from the Malchus of Koresh. Nothing, not a penny. He said to his people, give money and support the Jews. He gave back all the Kalim of the base of Migdash. But he didn't send enough money to rebuild the base of Migdash in its entirety. And in, indeed, what would happen a couple of years later, two, three years later, is that they said, well, the base of Migdash isn't up yet. It's taking time. There's a lot of fighting going on here, a lot of politics. And they were told, and, and Ahasuerus was told, you know, this is dangerous. The Jews build their temple. It's going to be very dangerous. They're going to rebel. The Jews are going to take over the world. The Jews run the world. And if you will let them to build the temple, your malchus is finished. Oh, yeah. If that's the case, I'm going to rescind the order for building the base of Megdash. So it comes out that Koresh, who had given permission to build the, the base of Megdash, the second base of Megdash, but it was underfinanced. And, un, and overcome by politics, world politics, so it never happened. It kind of reminds me of 67, you know? <gasps> All this excitement, we have our bias, right? We're gonna rebuild the base of Migdash. There was talk about that. There was at least three occasions where the Dome of the Rock, which, um, which really is not the place where the Kodesh Kedashim is, by the way, was wired with dynamite to blow it up. Did you know that? And who said, no, I don't wanna say no, but he only had one eye. Okay. Lahavdil. You know, I know somebody else only had one eye. He was not happy. He was not good for us either. But I'm not making any comparisons. As we're showing. But, so uh, there was excitement. 67 was like a flash of the orb of Mashiach. And it spawned a big, big return of, of, of Jews to Yiddishkeit. Tremendous. But that flame quickly fizzled. Within a couple of months, it was turned back over to non-Jews who would then forbid the Beis HaMikdash from even becoming a concept. By the way, not only forget the Beis HaMikdash, even from davening, there was going to be a big shul built over there in a, in a halachically uh, uh, minded way by Rabbi Gorin. You know, I'm not discussing the halacha here, but that was next. It was a flash, but we didn't get anywhere. Like the party of Purim night, it's a flash. It's Simcha, but it's not the big Simcha. On the other hand, when all of the money of the world is sucked out of the house of Haman and delivered into the hands of Mordechai, that money, within three years, rebuilds the entire base of Megdash. That's all it took. Three years from the point of the death of Haman till the Beis HaMikdash was really uh, totally rebuilt. And who was exiled from that place of the Beis HaMikdash? Daniel, Hanania, Mishael, Azariah, before it was destroyed. And of course, Mordechai himself. So we come, we come full cycle. Now, I want to therefore suggest that Mordechai, by being the one to transfer the wealth of the kingdom of Persia, which should have come with Koresh to begin with, but didn't happen right away, but it did happen later. And that was what was supposed to happen to begin with. All the wealth of the uh, coming at directly out of one of the wealthiest people, uh, for all intents and purposes, the king of Persia, who was Haman, because <laughs> uh, he could do whatever he wanted to do. He had the Tabat HaMelech. Anybody with the Tabat HaMelech is like a Melech. So the Melech, Haman, quote unquote, donates the money. And that was rectifying what Koresh never completed. Hence, Mordechai is referred to in the Torah as Marj Roar. He says, you're the one who's going to be the oil to finish the job. You only use that fragrant besamim oil when you're ready to go to work. When the Beis HaMikdash is complete, Mordechai finished the job that people like Daniel started. There's one more very, very important thing I have to mention to you, okay? Um, Daniel was the one 
who Hashem revealed the end times to. Okay? There's only two people, Chazal tell us, that were shown the full Geula. Number one, Yaakov Avinu. Number two, Daniel. Daniel from the house of Dovin Amelech. Okay? Now, it was coded in it was coded in to the book of Daniel. No one understands what it was. The very ending of the book of Daniel is Hashem says to Daniel, you're not going to figure it out. Sorry. I know you want to figure it out now, but you can't. Same experience as Yaakov Avinu. Bikesh Yaakov Legalas was a ketz, but it could not be finished. But what, more, what, what Daniel did do is he kept alive the famous Navua of Yirmiyahu that the Jews would return after 70 years. Which was which was confounding the goyim, and was what is what Koresh was deathly afraid of because they kept miscalculating. Was it from the time the Vuchanetzah took power? Was it from the time that they took over the Malchus Yehuda and exiled the the elite? Was it from the time that they destroyed the Beis Hamikdash? It was constantly being delayed, delayed, delayed until the actual date was from 70 years from the Churban itself. That was the correct, that was the correct uh, fulfillment of the prophecy. And you could argue that the prophecy could have been fulfilled in any one of the ways in any of those times had Klai Yisrael been worthy, worthy. But they, they took it to the very last, last, last thing. Daniel's role then is so important because he's the thing, he's the missing link between Yirmiyahu who, who gave a prophecy of the return to Mordechai, who would and Esther, who would finish the return. You understand? It's a three. It's a three-part, three-stage process. Yirmiyahu gives the good news that the base of English will be rebuilt. After he gave us the bad news that it's going to be destroyed, Daniel was the one who actually looked into the nevuah of Yirmiyahu in order to try and determine when this time was. That's what the, that's what the Mefarshim tell us. It's unbelievable. He was active in this Nivua. And guess what else he was? He was the one who interpreted that there was a mistake in the counting by Balshatsar. You understand that Daniel was very involved in the one was the proper count. It was all Daniel was all wrapped up. He was, you could say it this way, I would say poetically, he was a personification of the hopeful Nivua of Yermiyahu. Do you understand? That's who Daniel was. That's why he's a Zera. He's a zera. He's a seed that will come to fruition later. You understand? This is pretty heavy duty. We better have we better have a lot of salad on hand of a perm. Now that you understand the deep depth of what's really going on over here, the the the, the that the prophecy of Yirmiyahu was this tiny seed, and it grew a little bit into many seeds, and then it sprouted, and the tree that we hung Haman on was really the tree, similar to the tree that we would build the wood for the base ha-migdash. You understand what's really going on on a deeper level here. There's one more aspect of Besamin. If we think about the other part of Besamin, which is the Ketores, it contains all Jews, right? A reference to all Jews and, and a kapara for the entire Jewish people. So that's another thing about Mordechai and Esther. Their tshuva mission helped bring a real, like a, and Katarus was used to stop a plague of death by Aaron or Cohen. And, that, and they also, he was also Marge Roar in that regard. He stood between the Chaim and the Mason, literally, between the death of Hasach, who was the only person that we know that Haman actually killed, and, and the rest of the Jewish people and saved all of their lives. Okay, so just a word uh, before we conclude. I have two minutes, three minutes about our current matzah. <clears throat> Why do I bring up these, these uh, deeper understandings of what was really going on uh, between the key figures in the Megillah? Well, if Haman is the person who was used by Hashem, and we mentioned this last week, all the good things that came out of Haman, I'm giving a test now. Who remembers last week's shear? What were some of the good things that Haman, that came out of Haman, unexpected good, besides all the money to build the base of Megdash? What else came out of Haman that was really great? What came out of Haman was Shmuel Bar Shilas, the greatest Jewish educator of all time. He was a machanich par excellence. He was the Did teacher. His children, his children but, learned it in Abraham. Yeah, That's correct. All the kindalach. Uh, uh, Torah. What comes out of Haman is Torah itself. 
And because Kimu the Kiblo Yehudim, the Jews received the Torah, which means the Torah Shop Al Peh. We thank you, Haman. Gee, that's great. We get to live. That's number one. Because you made the stupid, stupid mistake of killing Daniel. And, and that was the key that launched our, our, our the decree being, being nullified, a decree that could not be nullified except by the Messias Nefesh of a tzaddik. Okay. And secondly, we brought us to Kabbalah Zatorah. And, so, and thirdly, you brought us to complete tshuva. And you brought us to unity, which is symbolized in the Matanas of Yonim and the Mishloch Manos. Er both in Yonim of unity. Wow, thank you, Haman. You're a great guy. You did good. You did good by us, Haman. Mordechai, on the other hand, uh, you know, the Midrashim are, are filled with criticism for him. He says, how could you have gone out in the street? And you, what happened to you was that you were in danger and you endangered Esther and you got Hatach killed. In fact, Esther is blamed for having Daniel killed to some extent. That's why she needed to fast for three days. Because the blood of Hasach was on the hands of Mordechai and Esther on some level, much unbelievable. Plus, Mordechai sent her. First of all, two things. He caused her to miscarry, which means that there would have been a, a, a king. A, 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 well, it would have been Mordechai's son on the throne instead of uh, Ahasuerus' son. That would have been a lot better. Second of all, um, she miscarried that child and she became usher to ever be with him again. So that they cut off their own Zerah. They had no, they, so that was their mysterious nefesh. They also gave up Zerah. Do you understand? Zeronim is also, says the Mishnah Bura reference to Esther, because she could no longer have children with Mordechai ever and only bear the child of, um, of this Russia, uh, Ahasuerus. Okay. So why do I bring this up now? There are many, many, there's, there's, there's a bitter thing going on in the world. War is always bitter, bitter. And Chazal tell us when there's war in the world between the nations, look at, look at it as relevant to the process of the Gula. It's part of the process of the Gula. There are many people on this planet who for whatever reason have set up this have entered conflict, whatever their reasons are, but it's a, a conflict of which there is no winner. There's only death and destruction. And who knows where it's going to end, right? Do you know where it's going to end? And do I know where it's going to end? Is it possible? I'm curious. Does anybody think that it's going to be localized only to uh, Kiev? And that's going to be the beginning and end of it? Hold on tight. And as Rabbi Schwartz and you being honorary members of this year, our honored members of this year have been told from how many months, I don't know how long, that this is going to be a time with lots going on. I'm sorry to take a victory lap on you, but it's true. Whatever I said, whatever I heard, it wasn't coming from me, whatever I heard from Big Tzaddikim, playing out right on schedule, which means that between now and after Pesach, anything can happen. Anything. Mark my words, anything. I heard from one tzaddik that we're going to wake up after Pesach. This I don't know. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Ready? And it's going to be a brand new world. Whatever that means. The world will be different after Pesach. Hopefully for the better. Let's hope. We don't know. That's what we're hoping for. But it's here. It's, it's upon us. And um, just like HaKadosh Baruch Hu used Haman, HaRasha, to bring us so much good, right? He'll use the Rishayim of our time to bring benefit to the Jewish people. They'll only do good. You know, if what happens here is that hundreds of thousands or who knows, tens of thousands of Jews are emptied out of the, you know, Eastern Europe and come to Eretz Yisrael. Isn't that worth it? Is it worth it? Maybe Akash Baruch has Rachmanus on them. Maybe has Rachmanus on other Jews in Europe who might be, feel their lives threatened and decide to come under the wings 
Hashem's wings, Bezos Hashem here in Eretz Yisrael. As challenging as it is, we're still under Hashem's divine protection because it says Hashem's eyes never leave Eretz Yisrael. This is where you want to be. Not New Zealand. New Zealand's packed with Nazis, by the way. But you want to be here. You don't want to be in Australia. That's no good either. Uh, you want to be here. This is going to be the safest place in the world. Clear out your extra be bedrooms, make space, get some old mattresses, because they're all are coming. You're all the friends and relatives are coming. They'll be calling you. you. Put us up for a few days, weeks, years. Sure. No problem. My wife wants to do our attic over so we can have an extra bedroom. Yeah, I'm not joking. This is what's going on. So Hashem is using evil to create good. But because of the Messias Nefesh of Tzadikim, that is going on, by the way, and I don't want to go into details, but there's a Messias Nefesh that's going on, and we have to be most in Nefesh too. How what can we possibly do? Number one, we also have to do tshuva. We also have to increase our awareness and, and, and be very careful on our Ben Adam Lechavero, very, very careful. It's a big avoida. Get out of our heads. Uh, learn more, daven more, uh, connect with Hashem a lot more, talk to Hashem, and ask for mercy for ourselves and for Klal Yisrael. This is our job, and of course, tzedakah. Tzedakah, tatzel, mimabes. I'll send you the information from Atanas Labionim, and I'm going personally to America, and believe me, I don't really want to go to America, okay? I do not want to go to America, because there's just too much going on. It's like leaving the front seat of I have a front row seat. What am I going to go there for? I, I want to be here. to watch. I'd rather watch it from here. You know, feel a lot better about that. But such is what it is. So I hope, uh, I hope I'll have your bracha and your tefillos to go, and pe should go with, with uh, success for tzedakah and come back and the merit of tzedakah and that we should really have a joyous, joyous perm. Don't, don't be afraid. But um, know that Hashem is stirring the world up if only to empty out a bunch of Jews and bring them here, if for, another, for no other reason, okay? So let's, be Hashem, we hope to see a brand new world, a brand new world, a good world, the world after the Mishta of Haman, the world after evil is destroyed, Bezat Hashem, and not allowed to run riot, which is what's happening right now. Okay, enjoy. Have a wonderful Purim. So hey, and we'll see you when we come back. Okay. Rabbi. Rabbi, I just think it's fascinating this idea of the Rishayim bringing about good for us and, and Geula. Starting, I mean, even from Paro, that he raised Moshe in his household. That's right. And Achashverosh, when he took off its ring, which really caused us to. Uh, to yeah. And I said that, that yeah. so we, all these things, Hashem, even though we, you know, I'm thinking, trying to relate it to today, Putin may be our uh, bring our gaula. <laughs> yeah, and if he is the biggest Russia, I mean, that's the name of his country anyway. Uh, <laughs> and they're pretty big, it's a pretty big country, so he's a big Russia. You could always say he's big Russia because it's such a big country. Oh, he's a tzaddik, we don't know, yeah, we don't know. He's the one who speaks about God. He's the one that speaks about, um, you know, uh, family. Yeah, family. I mean, he's not so. It's not so makbid on murder. Not, murder is not, you know, you know, that big deal. But, but other things, he, you know, family is good. He's good on family. Not good so good. He's got a couple of kids somewhere that uh, he doesn't acknowledge. Yeah, who knows if they're Jewish? So that, I heard that they're Jewish. But uh, we'll add this point. That's what we said last week. In other words, we don't know where the Basamim, the Marjur, is coming from. Is it from mm. I, my, my thesis, what we developed last week, I think, I, at least I think I did, was you don't have to drink a lot on Purim because the question of whether more good came from the Rishayim or more bad came from the tzaddikim is a debatable question you know it's a debatable yeah. question i could say that haman gets more credit than than mordechai on many levels i mean i don't have to say it the gemara said it the gemara says that the giving of the ring from ahasuerus to haman did more for the jewish people's tshuva than 24 neviim and seven mm -hmm. neviot no mm -hmm. what are they telling us 
We don't know the instrument. And the Lubavitcher Rebbe said this. I, okay, what I'm going to do is I have an article that I wrote that kind of explains this more in depth, which was the basis of the shear. I'm going to also send it, send it to Mrs. Leshen to distribute. Oh, but thank the, you. The Great. concept is you have one drink or two, you can't make that argument anymore because it's too complicated. Like you could argue the point. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get drunk, dead drunk to try to say, well, you know, that's interesting. Let me think about all the ways that Hashem has used Rishayim to our benefit. And are they really Rishayim or they deserve to be rewarded? Look, Haman got rewarded. Mm -hmm. He has the best mechanech of all time credited to him. It's a little confusing, isn't it? But that's well, the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's supposed to be. And that's all you have to do. Drink a little bit and take off the edge and say, eh, black is not black and white is not white. And it's not so push it. But we know that we do know one thing. It's all being used by Hashem with Tova Seinu. And even if we have Yusurim, that Yusurim is for our benefit. So this is the hard, uh, this is the hard level of Amuna that we're asked to step up to on Purim, in particular, as a preparation for Pesach, which is the Chag Amuna. And I'll send you the article and I'll send you information. And uh, yes, it is a very fascinating. So you understand. Drink a little because you can't even answer this question now. And if you have two drinks, you for sure can't answer this question. We don't have to drink, do we? No, you don't have to because if you, we take two sips of wine because I told you, if you open up the shear, you're going to start arguing with people. I say Haman was, a, was the best thing that ever happened to Jewish people. Debate. <laughs> Debate the point. No, I'm saying it's women. Women aren't obligated for that. Who said not? I, that's what I've heard, because women... Well, that's if you're going to say, Chayev Inish Lubsume means only men. Yeah, it, it's, it's um, obviously we want to protect women from, uh, from right, um, I don't like Shalom, uh, drunken people, but, um, you know, I guess ladies among themselves, they could. But in any chance, uh, the, the, we'll start with the mini simcha of the nighttime, in which we are really looking at the good through the evil, and then come to the big simcha of the day, in which everything is clarified how it was for the good. That's my Okay, thesis, ladies, okay? let's get together with All drink. too. <laughs> you well. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Gay gesund, kum gesund. You too. Thank you. Hatzlacha, Rabba. Thanks, Arleigh.